welcome back to Restless. You've joined the four of us, Father Joseph, Lauren, Diane, and Javier, as together we young adults try to seek a way through this crazy mixed up world, following Christ and being restless for him. You know, one of the kind of earth shattering events that happened in the, in the 1900s was the apparitions of divine mercy. And when Jesus appeared to St. Faustina back in 1920 in Poland, and that image and that message, I think, is so relevant for us today. You know, it's kind of interesting to notice kind of the historical issues of what was going on around that time. I and mean, if, if any century needed mercy, it'd be the 20th century. You know, with World War I had just concluded or was drawing to a close, and World War II was going to, about to come, and communism and the great amount of atrocities that was committed, God was coming, kind of trying to prepare the world for the need for mercy that was going to come about. So, um, first of all, I'm sure all you guys have seen the Divine Mercy image, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Have any of you been to the Divine Mercy Shrine? No. No. We were, we were talking over break. We're going to actually plan a, a pilgrimage for the four of us to go and see. Oh, Diane, what, what's that on your cell phone? Oh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I have the Divine Mercy image as a screensaver. Nice. So it's kind of just a reminder during the day. I look at it, I'm like, you know, just to calm myself down. Javier has it too. I got it too. I have my dogs. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I also have the Divine Mercy image. So that's three out of the four of us. Oh, wow. The Lauren the Pagan, uh, who has a dog. Lauren will change hers tonight. <laughs> well, dog backwards is God. So, ah, oh, nice. wow. Yes. Close. I don't know. Something like that. But uh, <laughs> so are, you, are you guys familiar at all with the, the message of Divine Mercy? Have you ever read the, the Divine Mercy, um, the Diary of Divine Mercy? I haven't read it, but um, there. Uh, when I pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, there's one of the videos that I that I follow. It's a YouTube video of the Divine Mercy Chaplet Rosary, and it goes through. Uh, there's readings from the diary, and if if anybody, if anybody, if any of our listeners are are, are um, they, if, if you pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I would highly, highly recommend praying it to the uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet Rosary video hmm. because when you listen to the readings from her diary um, and how she, the, the things that she went through uh, that the Lord allowed her to go through through his passion um, and pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet at the same time, it's just amazing uh, how much closer you feel to the Lord and what he went through. Um, and you can't even begin to imagine what she must have experienced. Um, so it just, it just brought me closer the first time I, I, I listened to it, the first time I watched it, it brought me closer to St. Faustina for sure. And what she went through and just where she was in her walk with the Lord and <laughs> how <deep>. far <laughs> I am. <laughs> Pretty deep. <laughs> yeah. And I read, um, pieces of the diary as well. And I think just some of the key messages that I got from that are, um, you know, Jesus appeared to sister Faustina and said to her, um, you're the secretary of my mercy, I've chosen you for that office in this life and in the next life. And he asked her to paint an image um, yeah. according to the pattern that she saw with the little signatures, Jesus, I trust in you. Um, and he told her that he wanted that image to be venerated first in her chapel and then throughout the world. And he said to her that um, the soul that will venerate this image will not perish and also promise victory over enemies on earth, and especially at the hour of my hour of our deaths. Um, and then he also talked about, you know, asking her to pray the chaplet that he taught her, um, and said that anyone who says it will receive great mercy at the hour of their death, um, and that priests could recommend it as to sinners as a last hope. Um, and another request of Jesus was for her was a for a special feast day um, devoted to the attribute of divine mercy. So. We have Divine Mercy Sunday. I think St. John Paul II instituted that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it takes place on the Sunday after Easter. And it's basically, um, Jesus said, in, I mean, in the diary, it says, whoever approaches the fountain of life on this day will be granted complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. And I think, Father Joseph, you probably know this better than I do, but I think on that day, it's not just like um, uh, an indulge or a plenary indulgence. It's like, because that there you have to sort of have like a detachment from sin, which I think is like super hard for anybody to meet. Um, but this is like, you know, no, you know, no strings attached. It's like you mm. go to confession, you receive communion, you're completely 
you know, forgiven of your sins and also of like the punishment. That's the lavishness of God's mercy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the, the phrase that always stood out to me from the, um, the diary was Jesus said, the greater the sinner, the greater the right they have to my mercy, the greater the sinner, the greater the right they have. Like, like it's something that we are owed his mercy. Yeah. You know? It just seems so backwards to right? to like, how we all treat each other. Like if someone wrongs you or hurts you or, you know, the worst criminals, let's say, like we all want to shun them, turn against them, you know, um, push them away, all these things. And sure, if it's like criminal, they've got to go through the legal system and everything. But Jesus is saying these people are, oh, are owed, right? Like the greatest amount of mercy. And I think if we all kind of thought that way, actually followed this message, we would probably treat each other better, you know, yeah. and like give more forgiveness or let things go, you know, Yeah. when we hurt each other. Yeah, I think it's definitely like a message that needs to be heard in our time, especially, but also for people like, I mean, I know that I have a hard time um, forgetting the past and like being scrupulous about things and all that, so... Um, I think it's just a, it's a very hard, like it's, it's a beautiful thing to contemplate. And I think that's why I'm so drawn to it because it's like, we can't understand this type of mercy. Like, I just don't understand it. And I think that's part of the beauty of it and just like kind of growing in trust of that. Yeah. Cause we human beings always kind of put, um, limits to our mercy. But it's like putting God into a box of like, this is what, you know, this is what I experienced, so this is what sort of, like, God must be. Like, I can't feel beyond this, and it's like, no, God is God is so beyond that. Yeah. You yeah. know? We put conditions on it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'll forgive you, but this, but that, you know. Yeah. There's, it's, it's, I think we as human beings tend to, like you said, always forgive conditionally, um, and or say we actually forgive somebody, but in our hearts we haven't truly forgiven them. And I think what Lauren was saying is spot on because, uh, you know, there's so many people that are advocates for, um, you know, just completely eliminating the death penalty. But then they'll say something like, oh, but Hitler should have gotten the death penalty. Hmm. And then you think about Jesus saying that it is the worst of sinners that are that have the highest right to my mercy. Um, I'm butchering what you said but no no that's uh, it does it yeah um and you think about that and you just like and, and you think about him um hanging on that cross and and looking at the pharisees and the and the roman soldiers and said father forgive them for they know not what they do and how much mercy he had in that moment and you try to put yourself in his situation and can't even put yourself in his shoes but uh, you try to put yourself in that situation and we face nothing compared to what our lord saved i mean uh, faced and yet we are very slow to forgive. Yeah. What's always struck me has been the example of the good thief. Because here's somebody hanging on the cross with no real hopes. He's never, you know, he's dying for his sin. And all he says is, you know, Lord, remember me. And Jesus says, yeah, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. Yeah. He didn't put any conditions on it. He's like, well, if you do this, then you can be with me in paradise. Yeah. If you earn this. But no, he's like, no, it's free. You know, you just have to ask for it. Yeah. That's, that's lavish. My goodness. One of the entries that I read, um, and I don't have it written down, so I'm going to butcher it again, but one of the entries that, that I read was that um, Jesus told uh, St. Faustina that um, if a sinner um, even prays the Divine Mercy Chaplet once, um, that just that one time he prays the Divine Mercy Chaplet or she prays the Divine Mercy Chaplet, that's enough for him to bestow his mercy on him. Uh, and for mm -hmm. me, it's like, oh, I just think about how much mercy the Lord has that that's all he requires. Yeah. You just pray this seven minute prayer. Um, and then that's it. You know, I'll show mercy to you. I think oh. sometimes, you know, our, our hearts are closed up, you know, but and God's looking for a crack. He's looking for a way in. It's the, the cement heart, the stony heart. And as soon as you open it a crack, like just praying the divine mercy chapel at once, all of a sudden every the grace just rushes in. Yeah. For sure. You know, because he's constantly bombarding us with grace and it's our own hearts that are res resisting it. Yeah. You know? But the challenge, of course, is, you know, what do you, what about if you don't like feel forgiven? Because like we say we trust in God's mercy, but sometimes I come out of confession and I'm like, did that even happen? Did it even change me? I don't know. Have you ever felt that way? Yes. I, I've, I think I've gotten better at uh, 
how I've done my confessions. Like I've kind of grown um, in having a more open confession and being more truthful. But then kind of conversely, I've been like, wait a minute, did I forget something? And like this and this and like, am I really forgiven? And I want the mercy. I want to be in a state of grace, you know, so I kind of overanalyze it. Um, but then, you know, opposite to that, there are certainly times when I've gone to confession and my heart is pounding in my chest and I'll start to sweat and it's private, you know, the priest does not know me, <laughs> <laughs> but there's certain things that it is hard to say, right? Um, it's hard to admit and I'll, I'll even like know it. I'll have it in my head. I'll have it like, say it, say it. And I'll like try to avoid it. Nope. I don't want to say it. And then. Got to get I'll, those out first. <laughs> Yeah. You know, say, Maybe say the tough the, ones first. Oh, yeah. See, I want to ease into it, you know, like <laughs> make the priest think, Put it I'm middle. not so bad. I'm not so bad, you know, and like, right. I also try to like explain my sins a little bit instead of just boom, here it is. <laughs> but other times, right, I'll do that. Like I'll face that, like those fears and all these emotions. And it is such a release. Right. And oh, I, I've like the priests I've gone to have just been so gracious and kind. And then also just kind of stuns me like i'm expecting i don't know a harsh penance and it's three hill marys you know and thank the lord for this beautiful confession i'm like wow okay you know yeah. like and you just feel so much lighter like walking out that's that's good you've never had a bad experience in confession well that's not true so <laughs> <laughs> um when i was young like in elementary school maybe eight we went to like reconciliation night, I guess. I don't know. So there'd be two priests up on the altar, one like to the right side of the pews, and then maybe two in the confessionals. And I was absolutely terrified of the confessional. And I still do not like it. Like, that's not what I go for. But so I went to... <laughs> it's dark and scary in there. <laughs> <laughs> it is dark. And you, you got to get the, like, the whispering just right, right? That's right. <laughs> so a little soft, you know, but then not too loud so no one hears. And that's a whole other story where... I did that. I was whispering. The priest asked me to speak up. I did. And he was like, oh, you may want to quiet down. I was yeah. mortified. <laughs> oh, no. Can't even tell you. But the, the first story was I went to a priest that, um, you know, wasn't American. So I, I don't know exactly where he was from, but he had an accent and it was hard to understand him. And I thought he told me to pray 500 Hail Marys. <laughs> and I told my parents that. What did that. you do? <laughs> like, are you with my brother? Like, that's it. That's all I did that back then. But... Yeah, so I tell my parents, and they're like, what? You know, like, same reaction as you. They're like, it's okay, you could do 10, you know, that, that'll be good. Yeah. That was just kind of funny. I think those scars, though, they do stay with you, because I had one really bad experience, and I left, like, crying. Not because of my sins, but because of, like, getting yelled oh, at. Oh, no. Yeah, and they were venial sins. Um, But, yeah, so now I'm so scared of going to... I mean, I, I do it and it's a lot easier of just like praying for the Holy Spirit to be with you and to like be truthful and just like get it out. Um, but I'm always scared of like, is the priest going to yell at me? Like I'm here because I know I did something wrong. Like, I don't want to be. But mm -hmm. it, it's true. Like Lauren's experience normally, it's like, I feel like God's mercy works through generally the priest and, you know, um, you kind of experience his mercy through that. Yeah. And maybe just keep in mind. The message of divine mercy yes. from Jesus. If you ever feel <laughs> yeah. bad for your sins yeah. going forward, because we know how He would treat us, right? He yeah. told us. So. Right, right. Well, I'll participate for our listeners uh, on Diane's and Lauren's benefit, <laughs> but you're my confessor, so. <laughs> um, but I, I I'm not listening. <laughs> I was blessed. Um, uh, I was definitely blessed as a kid. Uh, I would go into a Catholic school. Uh, the priest would come and knock on our door. Um, it was backwards in Venezuela, the priest, uh, and I don't know if it, that's how it is in private Catholic schools here, but the teachers go to your classroom. You stay in the same classroom throughout the year. You don't go from one classroom to the other. <clears throat> so the priest would come and knock on the door and say, hey, anybody wants to go to confession? I always raised my hand because I always wanted to get out of class. <laughs> um, and so just, but, but through that, whenever I did have sins to confess, um, being able to confess face to face just completely took away the fear from confession for me. I actually do not like private confession and Father Joseph knows that. I do not like private confession. I like confessing face to face no matter how hard it is because I just feel like I got to be man enough to like, you know, I got to be man enough to like, like to, to admit what I did and I don't like keeping sin in the dark. I think the enemy can actually get in there 
Um, and I've gotten better at that. I've taken that out of confession and into a more broad context to where I'm actually able to admit, you know, certain addictions or things that I've had in the past and stuff without any shame or guilt because I think it's the enemy that wants me to keep it hidden. And the more I keep it hidden and the less I bring it up to the light, the less I actually defeat it. So and so yeah. um, that's for me, that's why confessing face to face is so important because I don't want to hide behind a wall. I don't want to hide my sin. Yeah. You know, I think that's so important because that's how divine mercy shines on you is by yeah. bringing it out to the light. Yeah. Yeah. What, what you hide cannot be exposed to that great mercy. Yeah. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk more about this divine mercy image and the good news that Jesus came to bring us. Stay tuned. Hey, did you know you can take Veritas Catholic Network with you wherever you go? All you have to do is download the Veritas Catholic Network app. Then you can listen to the live broadcast 24 hours a day. You can also grab podcasts of our original shows like Let Me Be Frank and Restless and much more right at your fingertips and on your phone. Download the Veritas Catholic Network app today at the Apple App Store or on the Google Play Store or visit www.veritascatholic.com. And welcome back to Restless. You know, we've been talking today about divine mercy, both the divine mercy message and image from St. Faustina, but also divine mercy in our own life, how we've needed mercy in confession. But, you know, one of the aspects of mercy that Pope Francis kind of reminds us, uh, I think a few years ago, he had a year for mercy. And it was that if we wish to receive mercy, we have to be willing to give mercy. You know, and kind of there's that flip side. And, uh, do you find that to be a challenge? You know, if somebody wrongs you to forgive them or to just, you know, kind of extend that mercy to others? I think it's gotten easier for me over the years just because I realize in my own pride that like I do, you know, I'm not perfect and I do a lot of things to other people. Um, so I think it's more of just, you know, understanding that like, well, God forgives me for all of these sins and why should I be holding a grudge or um, harboring this resentment? Um against this person because I've certainly made mistakes in the past. So for me, it's been, that's not something that I really struggle with, but I don't know. That's awesome. It's kind of that idea of there, but for the grace of God, go I, Yeah. you know, recognizing, man, I'm, I've been forgiven so much. I can extend that. That's yeah. And I think when you have those great confession experiences of like feeling so nervous before of going in and, and just like, just like Javi said of like opening your heart and not being ashamed of like those addictions or those sins that you've committed, that it's like, wow, like God forgives me. And, and how can you sort of hold that sort of the, hold a different standard to another person? So, That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any stories of uh, maybe a time that you've needed mercy from another person or, or that you've extended mercy to another person? I'll just share in my own life. My, uh, my brother decided for about nine months to stop talking to the rest of the family, mm. um, including myself. And he had his own reasons for it. And, uh, you know, so about nine months into his kind of enforced silence, he comes to me and he says, hey, uh, I need some money. I need a loan. And my first reaction was, you got to be kidding me. The mm. first thing you're going to say to me is I need money. Yeah. <laughs> you're not going to say like, hey, how was your day? You know, or something like that, or just try to establish a relationship. And I was torn because I, I had the ability to give him a loan. And I was like, ah, you know, what would Jesus do? You know, what would Jesus do? I mean, Jesus would not bring up the past, would not bring up the past nine months. He wouldn't put conditions on it. So I said, all right, you know, that's, you know, I'll, I'll give you a loan. I'll give you a loan. But that actually was kind of good because it was a door open and I could talk to him and I said, you know, okay, here's the loan, but I do want to know like why you're not talking to the rest of the family. As so we talked a little bit and I kind of said, you know, you know, I hope you understand how much it's hurting us and everything. And, and then finally, you know, he, he did get reconciled to the family. Thanks be to God. And now he's, he's really very close with my parents and my siblings and myself. So I hope that maybe that extension of mercy was kind of the open door for him. Certainly. Because I, I think, right, I can only imagine you cut everybody out. You have to then think, well, well, everybody probably hates me now or they don't want a relationship with me now. But then you, just your action showed him, no, that may not actually be the case. And it's okay to try to move forward and make it better. I hope, because, you know, I hear so many stories as a priest about people that say, oh, you know, I haven't talked to my brother in 25 years because of something that happened at Thanksgiving 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, how sad is that? 
Yeah. You know, that you're not willing to get beyond that and let, let bygones be bygones. I just had a realization like this week that I, I think I've always thought of myself as a merciful person, you know, and that I would forgive people, but um, it took them kind of owning up, right, for what they did wrong. And it doesn't always even mean an apology, but just some kind of acknowledgement. And then I would say, okay. And like, I would just wait for that. Like, I don't want to fight with you, like friends, whatever it was, things like I've done with Ultimate, trying to work with people and tensions can just rise and, you know, feeling wronged and whatever it is. So just anything, I don't even need to hear like, I'm sorry, just some kind of acknowledgement. And for me, that would be like a, a release, right? Like, great. I, I want to let this go. I want to move on. But I don't know how you're going to treat me like until you kind of acknowledge that you were wrong. So that's been my experience. And then I just was talking to my spiritual director yesterday. And uh, she's like, you can't wait for an apology with people, right? Because you can't control that they're going to give you one or that they won't. And also, what does it really matter if they say sorry to you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you are going to be... Um, you're going to like have all your hurts removed and, and be comforted by our Lord. Everything mm -hmm. is through him. So if you're hurt, whatever you're feeling, whatever you have towards whatever person, you give it to him, right? And you ask him to intercede and you pray for this person, right? For their conversion, for whatever it is. And like, you can heal yourself through praying for them. And uh, that was really like a, wow, really? That's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm ready for that, you know, but um, even just thinking about that in like the last day, I can almost, I can already see how much better I'll be to just go through things that way. And that is like true mercy to me, like this whole other level that I never knew of or would have considered. You know, I once heard there a, an important distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. Yes. You know, because forgiveness is basically is the person that was hurt it's kind of sets them free from the anger, from the hatred. And, and so that's, it's, it's necessary to forgive. It's not necessary to be reconciled. You know, if somebody kills my mother, I may not necessarily be best friends with them, mm -hmm. you know, in the future. And, and that's kind of, I think the distinction that, that your spiritual director is making and that you made is that, you know, the apology piece is reconciliation. It means that they want a relationship with you again, but whether or not you get the reconciliation, we still need to forgive. Sure. You know, and scripture tells us if you, if you have a grudge or if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, um, do not bring your gifts to the altar until you've forgiven them until you, up until you've reconciled and, and the Lord gives us, um, the steps that we have to, uh, reconcile with each other for conflict resolution. And, um, uh, I, Oh, I struggle with those. <laughs> I struggle with those a lot because it says, uh, the scri scripture tells us that whenever we have a problem with somebody, we're supposed to tell them first. Right. No one else. Right. We're supposed to go to them first. Not your boss, not your... You're supposed to <laughs> not pray. Your sibling. You're supposed to pray first, right? Pray first and ask for the Lord to help you forgive this person or to help you get over this thing. But if after a little bit, you just can't get over it, you know, you're supposed to go to them. You're not supposed to talk to your girlfriend or boyfriend. You're not supposed to talk to your priest. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to go straight to them. And that has been very tough for me. That has been very, very tough for me in the past. Um, and in a way I've fallen into gossip. I've fallen into so many other sins through this and then not forgiven right away. Not just going straight to the person and telling them, Hey, you hurt me in this way. And, um, you know, I'm, I just gotta let you know. You know? Yeah. Have, so have you ever had to do that? I've only gotten to do it twice in my life. I actually done it well, the way that scripture tells us to do it. And how did it go? It went well. Good. It went well. They were receptive. And yeah. But even if it doesn't go well, you know, there was that, there was that obedience to the Lord. This is the way that I want you to, um, to, um, to pursue, you know, conflict resolution. And I know that there's going to be fruits later on, you know, there, there's going to be reconciliation later on or something, or something good is going to come out of that. That person's going to then, you know, repent later on or something. Or, but regardless, if none of that happens, you know, you, you followed what the Lord told you. So you grew in holiness. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You were, you were and I free. think the key part in, in how you went about that is that you, you said, 
it hurt me when you did this. Like you expressed how you felt versus I think most of us are accustomed and myself included is you did this, right? Yeah. And that was wrong. Like you were wrong, right? You We kind of like go on the attack because we're hurt. And then what does that do? Well, you did this, right? It just like escalates. Yeah. It goes right. nowhere good. It turns into an argument. But just expressing it hurt me when you did this, like calmly and openly and honestly. Yeah. Like hopefully whoever you're dealing with would be merciful back. Like, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. You know, yeah. but I thought that you did like, but, you know, hopefully it could be yeah. peaceful when you go about it that way. Yeah. yeah. To answer your earlier question, for me, forgiving little things has always been very easy because I'm a very non-dramatic person. I don't like drama. I don't like arguments. I am very quick to just turn the page because I don't, when I see an argument about to happen, I change the subject, I move on to the next thing and stuff. I think it's you and Diane are going to have a great married life <laughs> with, with other people, not with each other. I mean, <laughs> if you can, if you can get over small stuff, that's yeah. the key to a happy marriage. I think <laughs> Lauren, on the other hand, <laughs> Lauren's going to find someone little... that's always going to make her happy. <laughs> there is a butt coming. There is a butt coming. Uh, but when somebody does something big, I do, I have to admit it. I do have a hard time. Um, and it's not that I'll be, like really upset with them. It's not that I'm going to yell at them or anything. It's just that I find myself like weeks after I've said that I've forgiven this person, still not fully forgiven them, you know, like still kind of like seeing them and being a little upset that they're around and stuff. And I, 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 I fall to prayer because I'm like, Lord, seriously, this isn't even that bad compared to what you went through. And I'm still not able to be cool with this person, you know, I think forgiveness is not a one-time deal. Yeah. You know, something that we have to do over and over again whenever the thought pops back into our mind. And that, that's what I've dealt with, for sure. The feelings will come eventually, you know, but first forgiveness is a choice before it's a feeling. You, know? yeah. you may have to choice and do it just like a, uh, just a cold act of the will. A friend of mine who's in AA was telling me that um, one of the steps that one of his mentors were telling him to do is like, you know, if you, this was his third round of trying AA and he kept falling off the wagon as it were. And uh, he said like, I just want to, you know, I want to get healed. And the, the mentor said, all right, I want you to do this. I want you to go and pray for the person that hurt you. That, Cause that was one of the real reasons he was drinking was because to deal with his anger, pray for the person that, that hurt you and purposely don't feel anything. Like, don't feel love to that person. Don't feel any warm, fuzzy feelings. Just do it. Just make the action. Just say the words. And he's like, well, what if my heart's not in it? And he's like, no, it doesn't matter. Just say the words, you know? And he's like, okay. So he did it, started doing it over and over again. And eventually he started feeling it, started yeah. feeling forgiving, you know? It's a verb. It's like love. Love is not a feeling. It's a verb. That's what I hear a lot of people say. Right. You know, you learn to, like, you, you it's through being with that person, through forgiving them, through um, spending time with them through doing things for them through dying to yourself you're loving them it is a verb yeah. uh, one thing that i do want to say um uh is that to our listeners pray the divine mercy chaplet or pray anything at three o'clock yeah Just, hour of divine mercy yes yes I, I stop what you're doing uh during the day and just turn your eyes to the lord and say thank you for your sacrifice if you don't have the seven or eight minutes which we all do <laughs> if you don't have the seven or eight minutes that it takes to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, um, or if you just don't feel like doing it at that moment, although a holy moment is when you do something that you don't feel like doing, um, you just turn your eyes to the Lord and say, thank you for what you did for me. Yeah. Thank you for being merciful. Please teach me to be merciful like you're merciful. Please teach me to be holy like you're holy. And oh, I, I'm, I'm telling you that, that that moves mountains. And then another thing that I wanted to say is, when I started praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and then a couple months later, I started really learning about praying the Mass. Um, when I hear the words, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I think about the sacrifice at Mass. And so every time I pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I think about holding Jesus up to the Lord and say, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord. Jesus Amen. Christ. That's an awesome challenge to uh, challenge our listeners to pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet and to really take advantage of God's mercy 
which is granted to every sinner. Remember, the greater the sinner, the greater the right they have to divine mercy. And then also to seek to be merciful in our own life, to imitate that Father of mercies. Thanks so much for joining us in this episode of Restless. Catch us next week. You can find us on Veritas Catholic Radio, which is 1350 AM, and also wherever you get your podcasts. Hope to see you next time. God bless.